The Cardinals make a trade, some not-so-great news on one of their most consistent players, and why umpire Ron Culpa should be ashamed of himself after the Cubs defeat the Cardinals, all on today's episode of Locked on Cardinals. You are Locked on Cardinals, your daily St. Louis Cardinals podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey there, Cardinals fans. I'm J.D. Hafford, and I'm a national radio sports anchor, born and raised in the Lou and a lifetime Cardinals fan, and I'm your host for Locked on Cardinals, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. You can follow me on Twitter at J.D. Sports Radio and follow the podcast at LO underscore Cardinals. We are free and available wherever you get your podcasts, iTunes, Spotify, Google Podcasts. You can also find us on YouTube. Like, subscribe, hit the notification button so you know when new episodes are posted. This is a show serving Cardinal Nation and giving the best fans in baseball all of the info about the birds on the bat. So, um, tough loss today. Tough loss today for the Cardinals, whose winning streak comes to an end at six after losing four to three to home plate umpire Ron Culpa and the Chicago Cubs. Uh, I'll get more into the game itself and the horrific calls in the eighth inning by Culpa in the Alec Burleson at bat. We'll do that later in the show because. Man, did he have a rough, rough at bat. Okay, I'm not going to say the whole game was a tough game for him, but whoo, did that suck with the uh, the Burleson at, at bat. If Culpa's face is not on a dartboard somewhere in the Cardinals clubhouse after today's game, I'll be very disappointed in the boys. But moving on for now, trade deadline is still a little over a week away. We're counting down to it. August 1st is when it will take place, in case you weren't aware. But the Cardinals have already started wheeling and dealing. Well, sort of. It's Nothing major happened. But on Monday, the team, if you remember, designated left-handed reliever Henesis Cabrera for assignment to make room for right-handed reliever Mark Tapera on the roster. Now, Tapera has since been designated for assignment. That happened on Thursday to make room for outfielder Tyler O'Neill. Now, when designating someone for assignment, you have this uh, seven-day window where you can still make a trade with another team. If somebody wants to jump in and say, hey, we'll give you something for them, then that can happen. And the Cardinals finally found a trade partner for the 26-year-old reliever in the Toronto Blue Jays. Now, in exchange for Cabrera, the Cardinals have now acquired a 19-year-old catcher by the name of Samuel Sammy Hernandez. And every time I see the last name Hernandez, I always want to say it like the SNL character, Hernandez, the Will Ferrell one, where they're like in, in the hot tub and stuff. If you haven't seen it yet, go look it up. It's funny. But anyway, Hernandez was a 14th round pick in the 2022 draft and just turned 19 last month. He split his time between the Florida Complex League and low A in 2023, batting just 192 with two home runs. Uh, over at RedbirdRants.com, they actually had a, a scouting report on it. So uh, I ripped this from them. So a full credit to RedbirdRants.com for this uh, nugget of information. And here's what it reads. Hernandez was not a highly rated prospect in the Blue Jays system pre-trade. He doesn't walk much and is not likely going to be a hitter who boasts high batting averages as he ages. Per a few sources that spent time with him in the Blue Jays system, he was well-liked and is a total student of the game. He's very advanced defensively and has definitely shown some raw power. The write-up continues, saying, During Hernandez's high school years, scouts were high on his power tool, but that has yet to translate since he made his pro debut. Five foot nine backstop is obviously not a big man, but he is fairly athletic and uses his size to his advantage, especially on defense. After spending time as a catcher slash infielder hybrid in his high school days, he still possesses the agility and quick feet to perhaps line up at second or third in a pinch down the line. Think Austin Barnes of the Dodgers. So there you go. That's uh, kind of the scouting report on uh, one Sammy Hernandez, who the Cardinals acquired for Henesis Cabrera. Now, obviously, this is not a blockbuster deal by any means. It's not going to move the needle, but it's better than nothing, right? Because I had people online that I saw that were like, great, another catcher. So what? You weren't going to get anything for him. Uh, it, you could always use catching. Everybody could always use catching. Okay. 
I mean, you think about it. You're looking in our system right now. You've got Herrera. You've got Kisner. You've got Contreras. You got to think about later on down the road. This guy's 19 years old, so maybe he helps out at some point. And if he's as good as uh, they made him sound defensively, then he'll likely find a place somewhere as maybe a backup one day, maybe a Kisner type of person. Uh, Cabrera appeared in 32 games for the Cardinals this year, had a 506 ERA, struck out 38 hitters across 32 innings, signed by the Tampa Bay Rays back in 2013, traded to St. Louis as part of the Tommy Pham deal back in 2018 and made his major league debut with the Cardinals the following season. The native of Santo Domingo, Dominican Republic, has kept a 4.14 ERA, 1.36 whip over 174 career games. As I mentioned on Monday's show, when he got designated, uh, Cabrera's numbers have regressed dramatically since he came up. Since that 2020 season where he was 4-1, 2.42 ERA, had that ERA plus of 175, and you're like, holy cow, Cardinals caught lightning in a bottle on this one with that Tommy Pham trade. It appeared like he was going to be destined for big things in this bullpen and be a big piece moving forward. Part of the uh, big three with Helsley and Gallegos. And now with Hicks in there, instead of Helsley, Helsley's out still, Um, man, it just never materialized. He just got worse and worse. His velocity kept going down. And I was always a fan of Cabrera because I I liked his flair on the mound. I liked his, uh, you know, had the kind of Jose Lima type of attitude out there on the mound when he struck you out, he kind of flat, you know, flinched and, pumped his fist and, you know, he did, he did the thing. He was kind of a showman out there, but he also showed a, a lot of signs of immaturity over the years and a change of scenery might be exactly what he needs. So we do wish Cabby the best. And uh, we thank you for your contributions to the Cardinals franchise over the years, but um, it was time to move on. And, and I'm okay with this. That's fine. The Cardinals did get some not so great news on one of their players whose name actually has been mentioned repeatedly in trade talk. We'll talk about that next on Locked on Cardinals. For a championship team, it's all about making sure every player is a perfect fit. It's the same when it comes to your vehicle. Every part needs to fit just right. You can't just force the wrong parts into your vehicle and expect it to to, to do the right things that it's supposed to do, right? So the next time you need parts and accessories, you head to eBay Motors. They make it easy for you with eBay Guaranteed Fit. You can be sure that every single part that you need, it fits right, and it's going to fit right the first time. You don't have to keep shipping them back and forth with each other. All you have to do to make sure that you're getting the right part is add your ride to my garage and look for the green check to know that the part will fit or you get your money back. It's just that simple because like in sports, confidence. That is the name of the game when you shop on eBay Motors. And with over 122 million parts to choose from, you're going to be back in the game in no time. Nobody likes having car trouble. It's one of the worst and most expensive things ever. And you want to get back on the road as quickly as you can to move on with your life. That's where eBay Motors comes in. It's easy to bring home a win when the right parts are guaranteed. Get the right parts, the right fit at the right price on ebaymotors.com. Let's ride. Eligible items only. Exclusions apply. The Cardinals battle the Cubs the rest of this weekend on Saturday and Sunday. You can catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Cardinals. I want to thank you guys for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. You can leave comments on YouTube whenever you want, as well as on Twitter. Your feedback is always welcome and encourage love hearing from you guys and um, just talking ball like today a day game so we wait till afterwards to put out the podcast and during the game though back and forth on the old twitter machine we go and uh, we have a good time it's like we're all watching the game together i know today was a little bit tough because uh it was on apple plus not everybody signed up for apple plus and uh, i understand that it's your money you don't have to um i paid for it i i, I paid for it this year cuz it's basically I don't know, seven bucks a month, something like that. So anyway, I'm not here to tell you what to do with your money. I'm here to tell you what's going on with the Cardinals. And more specifically at this moment, what is going on with Brendan Donovan, who, um, you know, he's been one of the Cardinals most important players over the last two seasons, an elite level utility player who was so good with the glove last year that he won the first ever utility gold glove award in the national league. He's been doing similar things defensively this year, spent a lot of time at second base. That's where he's gotten the most starts, but you've seen him in left field, right field, first base, third base. He's made three errors this year 
all of them have come while playing at second base, which is supposed to be his best position. Uh, the guy is just one of the most versatile defenders in the game, a huge asset to the team. But where he's really showing off this year is what he's doing at the plate. Now, Donnie, don't get me wrong, solid last season, hit 281, five home runs, 45 RBIs, 379 slugging, OPS 773, all of those commendable numbers in his rookie year. He was he was a welcome addition to the team. He was a, a, a wonderful surprise. Like, I didn't even know who the guy was, really. And then he, call, he gets called up, and then he's playing, and then he just never left the lineup because he did such a great job, not only in the field, but also at the plate. All those numbers I just listed for you did that in 468 plate appearances. Now this season, in 339 plate appearances, he's hitting 284, 11 home runs, 34 RBIs, slugging 432, OPS 802. And remember, in the spring, we heard that he, that he beefed up a little bit, worked on adding a little more pop to his game, wanted to uh, you know add that dimension to what he could offer at the plate. And my, oh my, has that worked? I mean, that is exactly what he's done. Uh, they moved him around the lineup a little bit. Remember, he started in the leadoff spot, and then Newpar kind of took that over, and Donnie was kind of up and down. They weren't really sure uh, where exactly he fit in best, but he's found a home in the leadoff spot where he's hitting 303 with eight home runs and 26 RBIs this year, OPS plus of 123 out of the leadoff spot. You'll take that all day, every day. And more recently... He's been doing this because he's been hitting better and better in June and July. He's been doing it while nursing an injury to his throwing arm that has rendered him unavailable in the field. He hasn't been able to play. Uh, the team was hoping that uh, a throwing program would be something that would help do the trick, get him back out there sooner rather than later. But alas, that is not going to happen. Uh, some bad news, not end of the world news, but bad news, a persistent Right flexor strain is what it's being called, and it's going to keep Donovan out of the field for the foreseeable future. I honestly don't know if we'll see him play the field again this year. It's a possibility that he doesn't. Uh, he's gotten a no-throw diagnosis from this arm specialist that he saw in Dallas. Uh, hasn't played in the field since July 1st. We're now on July 21st uh, due to irritation in that right forearm that forced him to get scratched from the lineup. He has been able to DH and pinch hit. And he's done a great job in those roles. But it certainly limits what Ali can do with the lineup when the only place you can put Donovan is the DH spot. You're not, a, you can't put him into left or right or at second or at third and first, you know, on days where Goldie or Arenado need to get off their feet. You don't have him available right now. And that's, uh, that sucks because that's a big piece because you trust him to play both of those positions and now now you don't have them available there and you're without your other top utility guy tommy edmund who can play everywhere so um it makes it makes filling out the lineup a little bit tough when you want to get other guys into the lineup as far as their bats but you don't want them to play the field and then you'd rather see them dh but that means you can't have donovan dhing so it's kind of a mess um donovan initially diagnosed with that flexor tendon strain uh, the Cardinals shut him down from throwing for 10 days. When he restarted the throwing program, the pain, it returned, and he sought out a second opinion, went to see that specialist in Dallas on Thursday. Here's what Donovan had to say about the injury that he's dealing with right now. Quote, all right, where is it? Okay, there we go. Quote, we don't have a direction we want to go yet, and we are figuring out the direction the specialist wants us to go. When you're in competitive sports, injuries happen, and this is part of it, so I'll do what I can to help out. In the time being, I'm available to hit and pinch run and whatever they see fit. Now, according to the reports that I have seen, surgery has not been brought up yet. Not yet. Not been brought up as an option, but... You know, yesterday we did a show about how the Yankees would be very much interested in a guy like Brendan Donovan. A lot of teams would be interested in a guy like Brendan Donovan, but if he can't play the field, that's surely going to damper his trade value. Like, that's going to bring it down a lot. So perhaps it's a blessing in disguise for the fans out there who are threatening to riot and storm the Bush Stadium offices. If Mo were to trade him, uh, people did not like the idea of trading Brendan Donovan. I'm one of them. I don't want to get rid of the guy. But when you see what your need is for starting pitching, and if he can get you two elite young arms like prospects, and we don't know if they'll pan out or not, 
But if you can flip Brendan Donovan to get those things, you got to remember Brendan Donovan's not like some spring chicken. It's not like he's a 21 year old guy here in his second year. You know, Brendan Donovan is what 26 years old. So if you can do it, you got to think about it, right? Uh, Donovan did make a pinch hitting appearance in today's game. Again, I'm not saying I want to trade Brendan Donovan. I'm just saying if you get something pretty darn good in return, got to think about it. But like I said, did an appearance today at Wrigley Field, the game that the Cardinals lost, but not without some controversy in that eighth inning. We're going to talk about it next on Locked on Cardinals. The Cardinals are at Wrigley the rest of this weekend, and you can catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast with SiriusXM on the SXM app. Just search Cardinals. A bright and sunny day at Wrigley today. It had the feel of a playoff game, despite both teams having losing records. But, you know, that's why this is one of the greatest rivalries in Major League Baseball. You know, no matter how the standings look, you know that these two teams are going to play each other tough. Uh, the teams don't necessarily like each other. You've got the Wilson Contreras thing now where he just gets booed mercilessly at Wrigley Field, which I think he loves. Um, the fans, Cardinal fans and Cub fans, don't really get along all that well. I actually dated a Cubs fan for a little while, and um, let's just say it didn't work out. It didn't work out. Uh, but it makes for a fun day at the ballpark when uh, you know it's a good game. And the teams are battling it out. And that's what we had today. We actually had a really entertaining game to watch today. You had excellent starting pitching on both sides. Captain Jack Flaherty against Cubs lefty Justin Steele, who, by the way, just continues to impress me every single time I see him. And I don't know if he's, I haven't looked up every game that he's pitched, but man, is he make life rough on the Cardinals. He dominates. The Cardinals got to him a little bit in the second inning today. Bases loaded, one out, but they only managed to get one run on a, on Andrew Kisner ground out. From there, Steele pretty much dominated the lineup until we got to the seventh inning. On the other side, Jack Flaherty cruises, absolutely cruises through the first two winnings, and you're like, oh, yeah, Jack is on today. But then in the third inning, gives up a leadoff home run to the Cubs' 27-year-old rookie third baseman, Miles Mastroboni. That was his first career dinger. Ties the game up at one, and then he gives up a single. Then a double. That makes it two to one. And you can see Jack getting frustrated out there on the mound with his pitch placement. Um, wasn't happy with where he was throwing the ball. He ends up getting the next two guys. And it looks like he is fired up. And he's about to like limit the damage, escape the inning. Two to one. You'll take that. But the first pitch to Cody Bellinger. The one guy, I think, in this lineup, I guess you could say for Ian Happ too, that you just don't really want to mess with. And he throws Cody Bellinger a knuckle curveball that goes right into Belly's sweet spot, low and in of the strike zone, and he tattoos it over the wall in right field, makes it four to one. Jack visibly upset at himself after the inning was over, knowing that he almost dodged a bullet, but in the end, he got nipped right in the tuchus. And um, we're at a four to one deficit, but it's early on. But Justin Steele's kind of doing his thing. After that, Jack was strong. He goes six innings, allows only the four runs in that third inning. Walks one, strikes out six, one hanging breaking ball away from another quality start, but it wasn't meant to be today. Uh, the Cardinals actually end up bouncing Justin Steele later off. Seventh inning, you get a bunt single by Jose Fermin, his first major league hit. And I saw this crazy stat online. It was courtesy of uh, Jeff Jones, reporter Jeff Jones, who covers the team, who put the last Cardinal to record his first career hit on a bunt single was Britt Reams. On September 23rd of 2000, last position player was Charlie Chant, September the 1st of 1976. Wow, that's quite a stat right there. So congratulations, Jose Fermin, who I liked his game today. I, I've got no issues. Jose Fermin looks like he could be a, a solid utility guy, and especially with Donovan out right now, a guy that can fill in and play some second base and uh Help the Cardinals out in a pinch there. I like his hustle, and I, I like what he. I like what I saw out of them today. Uh, with two outs, Goldie walks. A wild pitch moves them up to second and third, and then Nolan Arenado gets the clutch two-run single, makes it four to three. We got ourselves a ball game. On to the eighth inning, and that's where controversy fills the air. With the bases loaded and one out, Cardinals are threatening. Ali calls on Alec Burleson to pinch hit for Jose Fermin. Some question why. Why was it Burleson over Gorman there? I haven't seen the post-game interview uh, with Ali yet, but my guess is that the reason he put Burleson in there instead, I don't know if there was anything bothering Gorman today, but Burleson doesn't strike out. 
Okay, that's one thing that he does very, very well. It puts the ball in play. And in that situation, and you saw it in the, in the White Sox series where Burleson finds a way to put the ball in play, gets the run in. And I think that's maybe what Ollie was thinking there. Again, haven't seen any postgame interviews yet, so I don't know if something was going on with Gorman today or not. But that that's the only thing I can come up with because <laughs> obviously Gorman – on fire lately, one of your best hitters. This is a huge spot, but maybe the strikeout thing was something Ollie was trying to avoid. But anyway, count goes to three and up. Okay. A walk's going to tie this game. Next pitch, just off the outside portion of the plate. So, what I'm going to do here, I'm going to put out the, uh, the picture on YouTube. If you're watching on there, here's a picture of the pitches. So, strike one is pitch number four there, just off the outside corner there. Home plate umpire Ron Culpa calls it a strike. It was close. I'll give him that. Makes it a 3-1 count. The next pitch is a couple of inches further off the outside part of the plate, and Culpa rings it up again. Now, the first one I am willing to let slide. Close enough. But pitch number five, if you're looking on YouTube, that is not particularly close, and it's basically in the right-handed hitter's batter's box. To call that a strike is embarrassing. That is embarrassing. Like, Ron Culpa should be embarrassed by that call. That is horrific umpiring by Ron Culpa. Especially given the situation, the magnitude of the call, what part of the game we're in. Like, the game should be tied at four. But instead, it's a 3-2 count. The next pitch is close to the same spot. But now Burleson feels like he's got a swing at it because Culpa could call it a strike. He doesn't know where the hell the outside part of the plate is anymore. And ends up grounding into an inning-ending double play. Cubs get out of it. And then, <laughs> then Culpa immediately boots Burleson after the call. Um Burleson, after he, you know, he peels off after he grabs that, he goes towards the dugout and yells something after the play was over. And I really, honestly, I wish that Alec Burleson had gotten his money's worth on this ejection because it was kind of a weak ejection too. It's not like Burleson called him a bad name or something, but he said something and Cole was like, Ugh, you're out. I would have loved to have seen like Burleson full sprint at Culpa, spike his helmet, give him a good old fashioned nose to nose, spit flying type of chewing and just dig into him because Culpa essentially took the bat away from Burleson there. And it's stuff like this that, that just bugs us, man, because the umpires are never held accountable for it. They never have to answer for it after the game. Media doesn't get to talk to them. And that drives us all crazy. And it's why an AI robot is soon going to replace people like Ron Culpa. You know, the fans are tired of it. The players and coaches are tired of it. The league's tired of it. They're bringing in the robot ups because of this. The automatic strike zones where uh, uh, something will go off to tell you if it was in the zone or not. Because these guys can't get it right. They keep screwing it up. Would the Cardinals have still lost this game? Who knows? Who knows? Maybe the Cubs score in the ninth and the Cardinals lose anyway. But that's not the point. To have an egregious call like that in that moment, it, it's unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And I hate it. And when you see other calls, and I'm not just going to pick on Culpa here because there are many umpires around the league that make really, really bad calls. And I've always been a guy that, you know, it, it's a joke, but at the same time, I, I think I, the umpires should have to, I always say, they should take a lap of shame after, after a call that they made is overturned, especially the really bad ones. And they got to walk around, they got to run around the, the, the track, the warning track and come back to their position. A lap of shame. Because nothing ever happens to these guys. Now, behind the scenes, I don't know if they get fined or anything or they, they get a little slap on the wrist or something. But, I mean, the league's got to say something to them about this, right? I mean, that is just unbelievable. The Cardinals still put up a fight in the ninth inning. Goldie gets aboard on an error. Wilson Contreras thing comes up, and you're like, oh, this is going to be a cool, you know, it's got some drama here. Wilson Contreras, go ahead, run at the plate. Tying run at first base, first pitch, gets hit on the right wrist. 
Hopefully he's okay because he was clearly in some discomfort when he took first base, but it would have been really cool to see Villain Willie show up again and make it like a fun it bat, but it got taken away from us because he gets hit by the pitch. Instead, Tyler O'Neill flies out to end the game when we lose. Um, outside of the Ron and Culpa being as blind as a bat in the eighth inning, uh, really fun game to watch. I enjoyed it. They go at it again tomorrow at Wrigley. one twenty start time, St. Louis time. Uh, Miles Michaelis will be on the hill against Michael Fulmer. And then on Sunday, you got Jordan Montgomery back on the bump. Uh, same start time, one twenty St. Louis time on Sunday. Thank you again for making Locked on Cardinals your first listen every day. Be sure to catch every pitch of the Cardinals hometown broadcast for the rest of this series against the Cubs with Sirius XM on the SXM app. Just search Cardinals. If you haven't already, please give us a follow on Twitter at LO underscore Cardinals and at JD Sports Radio. Like and subscribe on YouTube. You guys are the best fans in baseball for a reason. And I'll see you next time on Locked on Cardinals. Let's hope we don't have to hear that Go Cubs Go song anymore this weekend.